Appreciate everybody coming out. Uh, it's great to see everybody. Uh, I say that intentionally because uh, um, it's just great to be back to normal. You know, to be able to do things like face-to-face uh, -face press conferences and uh, be able to practice in fall camp the way that uh, the game of football was designed to uh, to be done. So. Uh, we're off to a great start. Uh, couldn't be more happy with, uh, we just finished our sixth practice uh, here this morning. Uh, couldn't, be, uh, couldn't be any more happy with uh, the progress that our team has made and the way we hit the ground running on the season. Um, it uh, was truly a, a great summer for our guys. Uh, I think uh, the spring season um, and the way that it ended um, it was uh, certainly not a satisfying one for any of us, and uh, and our guys came to work in the summer. Uh, we're here uh, the entire month of June and and most of the month of July. Um, got a lot accomplished together a, as a team, and what that's been able to do is put us in a situation where uh, uh, we've started camp well ahead of of where we uh, normally will start camp and. The, the carryover from practice in the spring is is evident right now. Um, we've got uh, we've got kind of an interesting football team, you know, and everybody in the country's uh, uh, like us, uh, where we've got uh, 21 starters uh, returning, all of our specialists returning. Um, at the same time, uh, you look at our roster. Uh, and even though we've got a bunch of, of six-year guys, um, the majority of your roster right now is, is all listed as freshmen uh, because you've got three classes of freshmen. You got your guys that were redshirted in 2019, you got your class that came in in 2020, and you got your class that, uh, that, uh, that came in this fall. And so uh, it's a blend of some very seasoned uh, players and uh, and a lot of younger players that uh, are hungry to play but have practiced a lot and so even though they might be freshmen by classification they're they're certainly uh, in a position where they can contribute um, you know I'll talk a little bit uh, uh, about our team and some of the players and then open it up for questions and I'm going to I'm going to be uh atypical and and I'm going to start with our specialists um which uh, not very many coaches do and you know we've got a really unique situation there where we've got uh, three uh, all conference caliber players uh returning uh leading off with uh probably the best punter in the country Brady Scott um who uh um Demonstrated that last year. He's uh, he's an All-American and a preseason All-American. Uh, his uh, his long snapper Dalton Godfrey and uh, our kicker Mason Lorber, uh, who all have uh, earned All-Conference honors at one time or another in their uh, careers here at at uh, USD. Um, guys that uh, are really important to our football team. Uh, we take a lot of pride in the kicking game here and being able to execute at a high level and what that means towards winning football. And uh, to have a group like that uh, uh, returning is is uh, a, a real plus for us. Uh, we did add some depth to that group uh, with a, a transfer from Iowa State by the name of Eddie Ugamba. Uh, Eddie is both a very talented kicker and uh, also a, a punter. Um, and uh, you, you may well see him. He's got a very strong leg, uh, and uh, you know, from a kickoff standpoint, uh, you know, certainly a, a guy that uh, will uh, will be in the mix uh, for us, uh, along with uh, his ability to uh, to kick field goals and point after touchdowns. Uh, <clears throat> going over, uh, you know, to uh, to the offensive side. Um, uh, and I know everybody uh, had questions last year, you know, about quarterback uh, with the departure of Austin Simmons and, um, you know, Carson Camp came in as a true freshman this spring. Um, didn't play like a true freshman, uh, even though there were some ups and downs uh, through the, the four game set that we uh, that we had. 
um, but uh, uh, is, a, is a guy that I, I really feel uh, can continue to develop uh, here in, in what will be his first full season uh, and be uh, you know, one of the, uh, the top quarterbacks in the league. Um, he's got a good arm. Uh, he's got that savvy that you want those quarterback, that quarterback position to have. Uh, he's become a, a very, a very good leader here through the off season with our football team. Uh, a real student of the game uh, reminds me a lot of uh, Chris Strebler in that regard, in terms of his commitment to studying the game and wanting to improve. And and uh, um, you know every. Every practice is still a learning opportunity for him, uh, and uh, excited to see him continue to develop uh, through the preseason headed into uh, week one. Uh, the running back position, the only place that we, I guess you could say that we lost a starter uh, on the offensive uh, you know, side of the ball. Um, uh, we, we feel really, really good about uh, uh, our depth and quality at that position. Uh, even though they're all young, uh, you know, three of them you got to see in the spring. Uh, Travis Tice, uh, who uh, who didn't practice today, we kind of held him out of team stuff today, uh, along with uh, two, um, uh, wh whatever you call them, COVID freshmen, uh, Mike Mansuray and Shamari Lawrence. Uh, you know, those three have have uh, really proven that they can play uh, at a high level in the Missouri Valley Conference, and and we've got some additional depth at that position too. So, uh, you know, it might be a little bit more uh, running back by committee, uh, but uh, I like what that committee uh, brings uh, to the table. Uh, as we move out to the perimeter positions, um, uh, tight ends, uh, Brett Sampson, who's a returning all-conference player, you know, one of those seniors uh, that uh, decided to come back and play that sixth year and, and uh, uh, very excited that he made that decision. He's an outstanding player, become a really good leader for us on the offensive side of the ball. Uh, he and Austin uh, Goring, uh, two, uh, two tight ends that uh, you may see on the field a bit more this year than what you've seen in the past in some of the formational looks that we'll be running uh, just because of the multiple things that they can do both in terms of blocking and, and, uh, and receiving. I've got a full complement uh, receiving core back. Uh, led by uh, Caleb Vanderesh, uh, who uh, uh, had a, a really good year in 2019 and, and played really well uh, this past spring. Uh, Cody Case back healthy uh, even adds more to that group and, and gives us a real true speed threat uh, to go along with probably five, six other guys that we have a great deal of confidence uh, in, in playing and, and guys that have all been on the field, uh, guys like Wes Elador, Jamon McQuitty. Uh, and I could get Carter Bell, I could keep going on there at that position group, but uh, maybe one of our deepest position groups as it typically uh, uh, has been for us over the last uh, few uh, seasons. Uh, the offensive line, uh, you know, a group that thought really played well in 2019, a group that maybe didn't quite get into to sync uh, as well uh, last spring, um, you know, returns uh, all the starters there. A uh, group that uh, has made uh, great strides in the offseason um, and uh, over the, the course of the first six days of camp, uh, you know, they're back to being the group that I think that group is capable of being. Um, you know, you look at the returning starters and obviously Mason Scheidegger not practicing right now uh, due to an injury, and, and uh, uh, but uh, the group that uh, you know, is that uh, that's uh, uh, the rest of the that group uh, healthy and and playing at a really high level um, with uh, tackles Colton Harberts and and Alex Jensen, who's been a multiple year starter for us. Um, guards Isaac Urbis, Joey Lombard, uh, and Austin Wallace, who we've moved into guard. Uh, Austin's started games for us here over the last couple of years, both at tackle and guard. And then uh, Key and Rex Row Potts at uh, at center. Um, you know, a group that's got the physical size. Uh, 
you know, and got the experience uh, to uh, um, to be a, a quality group uh, and a group that can uh, do a good job protecting our quarterback and needs to do a better job, which is something we need to do a better job of than we did a year ago, and and uh, also a group that's going to help us run the football better uh, than we did a year ago. Uh, on the defensive side, uh, we've got starters back at every position. Um, you know, we really uh, lead off that group with our linebacker core, uh, where we've got uh, multiple uh, all-conference caliber uh, young men, um, you know, led by Jack Cochran, who's been an academic All-American for us. Uh, Brock Mobinson, the other inside backer, who had a really outstanding spring season for us. Uh, Jake Matthew on the outside, uh, another all-conference caliber performer, and then uh, Jakari Starling. Uh, we've got a little bit more depth there um, you know, with, with guys that have uh, had an opportunity to build some playing experience uh, there with the guys like John Jonas and, and uh, Jakari Starling, uh, Stephen Hillis. Um, guys that have played a lot of football for us, maybe not, you know, started a lot of games, uh, but, uh, um, you know, will uh, uh, we'll, we'll give us a lot uh, of depth at those linebacker positions uh, throughout, the, uh, um, throughout the season. Uh, up front, uh, Devlon Whitcomb, another guy that, you know, returns, he and Jack Coker, uh, two, uh, two six-year guys um, that... Uh, in the defensive interior, um, and uh, uh, the two starters that end there, Mike Rohn and and uh, uh, Brennan Webb, um, you know we we you know, are multiple in our looks. We'll play some three-four looks as well as some four-three uh, looks, and so you know you're going to see some times when we've got four defensive linemen on the field, and sometimes when when we have three defensive linemen on the field. Uh, as part of our defensive scheme, and and uh, you know one thing in our league right now is you got to be able to stop the run, uh, and so we've worked really hard here through the off season, uh, and and uh, it's been a big point of emphasis so far as we've started preseason camp, and and uh, uh, you know focusing on uh, our uh, our ensuring up our our rush defense. Uh, knowing that that's going to be a critical thing for us uh, for success during the year. Uh, in the secondary, uh, you know, the two safeties, uh, uh, Isaiah McDaniels and, and E.J. Reed. E.J. being, you know, a guy that's really been a three, four-year starter for us. Um, E.J. another one of those sixth-year guys uh, that made the decision to come back and and make the most out of this uh, uh, final opportunity to play at uh, at the University of South Dakota, um, and at the corner position uh, where we were young a year ago. Uh, now you know we we returned a lot of experience uh, with uh, with Miles Harden, uh, who uh, was on the uh, newcomer team, uh, uh, Trey Jackson, uh, Cam Tisdale. Uh, uh, another guy in the secondary, uh, uh, Dayron McKinney, who transferred from Iowa uh, in January, uh, was not eligible to play in the spring because he had played at Iowa in the fall. Uh, is a is a guy that's going to be a, um, a real positive addition in uh, in the in, in that back end of the of the defense uh, with what he brings. Um, uh, from uh, from both a corner or possibly safety standpoint. Um, so one of the big things, you know, as we go into the rest of the preseason now, you know, we're going to start, uh, you know, working a few more situations, you know, getting our starting to already, you know, head to to moving to game ready, but we're also going to continue to develop some of our our younger guys. Um, I like our our young our, our young guys from the last two recruiting classes, uh, guys that are going to impact our program early on uh, and provide us uh, with that, that additional depth, which I think is one of the key things in making a run at a Valley Championship. Uh, you got to have uh, you got to have depth. Um, because when you're playing the kind of schedule that we play over 11 games, uh, you know you're gonna you're gonna have to have uh, depth at multiple positions uh, to uh, to be able to 
uh, to be uh, uh, the kind of team that you have to be to, to win. Um, I think the Valley's going to be uh, unbelievably strong. You know, every, as I said that when I started, everybody's kind of like us. You know, everybody's got a bunch of returning starters. Uh, that you know, teams are more mature than they've ever been because of the, the number of sixth-year players there's going to be in the league. Uh, it's going to be a year where uh, every week uh, you're going to have an outstanding uh, opponent and you're going to have to find wi uh, ways to, uh, to win games. Um, and I think that's one of the things that's uh, uh, we look at the last couple of years. Uh, you know, we, we've, we've not done a good job of winning close games. And, uh, you know, for us, that's one of those critically important things. We've got to we got to win our, our fair share of the close games to, to be in the hunt uh, for a conference championship at the end, which is the goal that this football team has. Um, you talk to any of our guys, you're going to get that as a response that, uh, you know, they think this is a group that uh, um, has the ability and and believes that they can make a run at a conference championship. And, and uh, um, that's what their focus has been. And that's what's shown on the practice field over the first six days. So with that, I'll open it up for questions. How good does it feel just to be back to kind of a sense of normal and just to think of this place being full? <laughs> yeah, um, uh, you know, as much as I wanted the spring to seem normal, Barry, it didn't. That this the spring season was was strange. I think you talk to every coach in the country; they'll tell you the same thing. It just you know for some reason you know trying to trying to practice in January and February and and what you had to go through um, to be able to play. It was uh, you know playing in in environments where there were hardly any people. Um, it, it, it was a weird feel, and uh, I will tell you this: you know, getting, you know, August, starting preseason camp, uh, which for 28 out of 29 years as a head coach has been something that we've always done. It it seems normal, and even though we're still dealing with a few protocols related to to COVID and and uh, things that we're going to continue to do. Um, it's no, it's 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 been a, a really great feeling for me as a head coach, and I know it's been great for our guys. What's the status of vaccinations at this point? Um, we are uh, our team is uh, we got quite a few guys that are still in vaccination, uh, what I'll call in progress, but we've had really great response by our by our guys, um, you know, we're going to be at a very, very high rate by the time all of the guys that are in uh, uh, progress right now become fully vaccinated. Um, you know, we're, we're the NCAA now is mandated that that, uh, you know, all of your unvaccinated people will have to test. Uh, and so we are testing those guys uh, that are unvaccinated and not fully vaccinated. But uh, as we get later this month and get closer to the first game, it's going to be very few uh, percentage wise that we're going to be uh, dealing with here, which, you know, which is a good thing where we've tried to educate our guys on the, you know, on the advantages and and uh, provide them with information uh, regarding the process and use some you know, use some uh, people from uh, from Sanford, our our uh, um, our health partner, been very helpful in that regard, and um, we feel like we're in really good shape. Does in progress just mean one of two shots? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, or not two weeks from their final shot. Sure, sure. Yeah. Does the fact that, I mean, as far as I know, the valley will probably fall like every other league, and if there's a significant number of people gone, it's going to be a forfeit as opposed to a postponement. Is is that weighing a little heavily on people that if you know if it happens like last year, we're not only are we not going to play, we're going to take an L? Yeah, I think that's been part of the educational process. You know, where we've talked about not just, um, you know, the we, we had health professionals come in and actually talk about the vaccine and answer questions, uh, but we've also talked about it from a team perspective and and the fact that how this might affect our ability to to play and what the results of, of, uh, 
of uh, having a number of players out would be in comparison to uh, to the spring. And so, um, you know, I, like I say, I, I you know our our, uh, our guys have responded very well. Um, you know, they've asked questions, they've gotten the information that they needed, and and uh, we've moved forward in that regard uh, significantly since. Uh, early in the summer when a lot of programs across the country, you know, were really struggling with their vaccination numbers. Did players give feedback on what impact having the experts come in and talk to them uh, had? Did that help them at all? Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, we had uh, Dr. Jeremy Cowles from Sanford come in, talk to our team. Uh, uh, I, I think um, yeah, it was really helpful. It provided our, our student athletes with an opportunity to ask questions. Dr. Cowles is actually a part of the NCAA COVID advisory group. And so he's been firsthand in, involved in helping the NCAA, you know, make uh, some of the decisions that they've made uh, regarding, regarding COVID protocols. And uh, it's great that we have a resource like that. Um, that uh, was willing to to take time to do that with our team, but uh, it was uh, it was a really helpful session. Any injury related notes other than uh, um, Yeah, we've got a few guys that you know are you know it happens all the time in in training camp. We've got a few guys that uh, are uh, you know that didn't practice today or were holding out of. Full contact, but uh, you know, as of right now, nobody we anticipate would would miss uh, game one. How soon do you expect uh, Travis and Mason to be back in contact? Uh, Mason's a little, Mason's up in the air. Uh, we would expect Travis to be back. I mean, he he practiced today, and uh, guys in black jerseys are no contact uh, guys. That's why you see some of the black jerseys on the practice field. You know, he practiced today. He's just not. Uh, available for contact, and so I anticipate that to be, you know, to have him back here relatively quickly, in a full goal capacity. And what strides have you seen from Carson so far, just early on in camp? Uh, one, one more time. Uh, what strides have you seen from Carson uh, early on in camp? Um, well, I mentioned, you know, I, I think one of the real important things, and probably, um, you know, something we don't talk about enough, you know, because we talk about how well they throw the football or how well they run or a combination of both is. The aspect of of uh, uh, being a leader, you know, and and because uh, that quarterback position, you know, has got got to be your on the field leader of your offensive unit, and um, he's taken some major steps forward in that regard. Um, the other thing is, uh, and this is one of the things we came out of the spring is we, we've. <clears throat> felt he was very talented, uh, getting him to play at a very consistent level with regard to both decision making um, and uh, um, you know the 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 decisions that he's making throwing the football and and that that consistency has certainly been develop is developing and he's taking steps forward in that regard as well. What area or areas would you say need? Most you're going to get over that, huh? Yeah. Win the uh, I mentioned one of them, and that's, you know, we, uh, um, you know, our league's changed a little bit. Um, the Missouri Valley you know, Football Conference has changed a little bit offensively. Um, you're seeing, you know, more uh, what I would term run first football teams. Um, you know, it used to be just kind of North Dakota State, and now there's maybe two, three other teams that are really heavier personnel <clears throat> uh, running the football, uh, even to the extent where they're running their quarterback more as uh, that type of, of offense. And so, you know, one of the things we got to get better, we got to get better at is we got to get better at stopping the run. Um, and uh, <clears throat> the balance of that is, you know, we got, you know, we, we've been a, you know, a team that even though we've we've led the conference <clears throat> in rushing and or excuse me in passing, I think in 17, 18, uh, and uh, 19, um, we've also been a team that offensively has rushed the ball fairly effectively, and um, we want to be that kind of balanced offensive football team, and you know that's not something we did real well in the spring, and so those two elements, um, you know, we've devoted more time. Uh, to uh, both uh, in in terms of the work that we've done, crossover work that we've done, 
uh, related to running the football in the first six practices than probably, you know, we have done since I've been here for sure. And, uh, and that'll continue to be an emphasis for us. You've been coaching for 29 years. And as you mentioned earlier, you have basically three classes of freshmen, probably your youngest <laughs> Has that changed your approach at all coming into the season? Yeah, you know, it's it, it's it's really kind of a uh, I don't, I, it's a that's a good question, but you also have to consider that part of that freshman class has been here for two full years, you know, and so even though they're freshman eligibility wise, they're so much further along in their development, both physically. And from a football standpoint, than what a typical freshman would be. You know, they've had two years of practice. They've had two years in the weight room. Um, and so um, the the approach, uh, my approach really hasn't changed. You know, every year you have you have things that become points of emphasis that you're working on in camp. Um, I think the one thing that's been far different this preseason is the fact because we played and had a lot more practices in the spring than we typically have had, um, you're able to hit fall camp running. Uh, you, don't, you don't spend the first couple of days kind of going back over and reinstalling. It's really hit the first day of camp running your stuff offensively and defensively. And, and some of that is, you know, a tribute to our guys to make the commitment, you know, over the summer to, to be here and be in training camp shape um, uh, where, where you don't have to worry about that component as well. Excuse me, how do you feel the offensive line has been coming together? It's a fairly young group, not a lot of uh, veterans on that group. How do you feel they're starting to gel together now through six practices? Uh, you know that group uh, really rolled up their sleeves and and uh, had a great had a great summer working together. That entire position group was here uh, the entire summer. Uh, they were always out on their own doing extra stuff, and that showed up just in their. Uh, I think that has shown up, and you can see it in practice just the way they are playing together. Um, you know they're they're on the same page. Uh, that that position group walked away from the our abbreviated spring season <clears throat> as disappointed as as anybody in our football team because uh, they realized that they didn't play um, as well as they played in 2019 um, and uh, uh, knew they had a lot to prove and and are are proving that right now. How much help is it to have? You know that offensive line gel together more to protect your quarterback who's still still growing into his role as a yeah player. yeah I think you know quarterback uh, any any time you have a quarterback and particularly a young quarterback if you do a good job of protecting him and and uh, you know it just it's it's so much easy for him to to play and um, um, you know he was under pressure a lot uh, last year as a freshman. Um, some of that, uh, you know, was him holding the ball too long. Um, so it's a combination of things. It's not always the offensive line's fault. You know, they get blamed for a lot of things when, when maybe it's not. But, uh, you know, that combination of him working together with that group and having confidence in each other is part of our growth offensively and, and uh, continues to be uh, something that we work on. You talked about it a little bit, but on the linebacking core, veteran group, a very strong group. How important is it for you guys to have a strong linebacking core to help the rest of the defense out? Yeah, you know, if you're if you're going to have an experienced group on defense, I, I think uh, the linebacker group is is the right group to have it because of the overlap that they have both in in your pass coverage as well as uh, in in defending the run game. Um, and we've got some really good leaders. You know, Jack Cochran is a good elite, as good a leader. Uh, you know, I, he's going to be a three-year captain. Um, you don't have many of those in, in college football. Um, and uh, but there, but there's other leaders in that group too. And and uh, um, you know, a group that that's going to push everybody on our defensive unit um, because. That uh, those those guys in that group are they you know they're 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 the they're the guys that are the first in the weight room the last out the first on the practice field the last off every day. And 
with the linebacking core, um, how important is it? You talked about you know the conference moving towards more of a run first offense. How important is it for your linebackers to be able to hit the ball early um, in terms of in the running game and help out your defense in stopping the run? Yeah. Um... You know, it's it's become a league where you've got to get multiple people involved in defending the run with uh, the heavier formations, uh, the the bonus type runs that you're seeing in our league, and on the, and so your linebackers, your safeties have got to be good run defenders. Um, and uh, if you're not, um, you know, it's 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 going to be a tough tough year for you. And, and so it's been a focus for us to, to make sure that we've got those guys in situations where they can play fast and play downhill and have confidence uh, in the run game. The NCAA granting everyone another year of eligibility and those scholarships rolling over. How has that affected your recruiting? Um, <clears throat> you know, the 22, the 22 class, you know, and I, I and, uh, you know, as we've had opportunities uh, now to to bring, you know, or for 22s to come to campus, you know, because we were in this COVID dead period uh, for so long. Um, the one thing I think the 22 class is going to have the is going to be the most affected because everybody right now has large returning rosters, and uh, with. Uh, the fact that the NCAA is allowing you to exempt this year's seniors, that goes away after this year. And so then teams are going to have large returning rosters. And so recruiting the re everybody's recruiting class in 22 is going to be slightly smaller than a typical recruiting class. Um, and so it's not just us in that regard. I think it's really everybody in the country that's kind of in that situation. And so, to a certain extent, I'd, I'd feel I feel bad for 22s <laughs> because they're kind of stuck in that. Um, but you know, it, it'll it'll start to flatten out, and things will change after that. But um, that's where I see this next recruiting cycle being a little bit different. Is that teams just aren't going to have. Um, the the same number of available scholarship opportunities and and for the for incoming 22s as they would normally have. Do you expect for that to have any impact on transfer numbers? You know, I don't know what's going to go on with the transfer portal. Um, you know, I don't think it's a great thing for college athletics. Um, I understand why the NCAA did it. Um, uh, I, you know, I, I don't know the exact numbers now. I know at one time it were, we were encroaching 4,000 Division I football players in the transfer portal. And the last I heard, um, there were less than 700 of those that actually found in a, 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 a Division I scholarship opportunity. So that means there are a lot of guys in the portal that probably didn't find a home, period. And... Uh, you know, my concern, uh, my concern within the framework of that is, um, you know, what is that eventually going to do to people academically? You know, if, you know, and 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 uh, I'm I'm hoping that the NCAA tracks some of this and and starts to show the other side of transferring and what that really means in terms of. You know, young men that leave one place thinking there's someplace better, and they find out that hey, you know, educationally it didn't work out as well. And but it's going to be with us. I mean, you're, you're, you're going to every program in the country. I, you know, has has players that went in the transfer portal. And if there's four thousand total, and there's two hundred and fifty, uh, sixty. You know, Division One football programs. That means, on average, everybody's got a dozen or better. You know, that that ended up in the transfer portal. And so, um, you know, some programs have committed that they're going to, you know, put a lot of their recruiting emphasis in the transfer portal. You know, I, I'm a firm believer that, you know, from a programmatic standpoint, that. You know, the best way to build a program is recruit freshmen, develop them, make sure that they're getting an outstanding education. Uh, at the same time, you know, we're going to end up, you know, taking 
you know, a, a small number out of the transfer portal every year ourselves because you're going to be forced to because you're going to have to fill in the gaps uh, with experienced players. And, uh, um, you know, my, my hope is that maybe, you know, two years from now, some of this information comes out and and uh, and and how it looks and and guys see that, hey, there is something to be said about staying in a place and developing and being committed to getting a degree and and it doesn't become quite as exciting to to enter the transfer portal. But that's coming from an old guy. Coach, this is your sixth season now, and obviously everybody within the program is somebody that you've recruited. Certainly you've seen the buildup of the facilities around here. It feels like you really have everything. This program really has everything it needs to be a consistent winning program, playoff program, and as you mentioned, striving for a championship. Does this feel like kind of a pivotal year? I know you had the one playoff season. But does this feel like a pivotal year to, to making that turn with everything that's now in place? Our goal every year is going to be to compete for a conference championship, um, and uh, you know we've we've got uh, with the addition that we um, you know in the commitment that the university made here from a facility standpoint, you know some of the areas that were uh, areas that uh, um, that you know we maybe weren't in the, the upper group in the league uh, from a facility standpoint. Now we've addressed all of those. Um, and so there really aren't, you know, we, we talk, we, I don't know if you heard me on deck, you know, our, our, at the end of practice, you know, our phrase is, hey, there's no excuses, we need to win. And, um, and that's the approach that, uh, um, that we have as a staff. Uh, that's what our team believes. Um, you know, we've got, uh, uh, we've got a group of guys that are working really hard and, uh, um, you know, want to be ready for uh, play our best football of the year down at Kansas. Uh, you know, playing games like that and playing the non-league schedule that we have, I think, do help us get ready for the the Valley schedule. Um, you know, the problem with the Valley schedule, and it's what's what makes the Valley schedule great. You know, and you guys just saw the the poll come out yesterday. You know, you're playing a top 25 team every week in the Valley. And um, and that's why it's it's critically important that you you know that you keep your good players healthy um, that you have depth um, you uh, um, you know you you play uh, you got to play your very best you got to take care of little things um, because that's really what it's going to take you know for for us or any team to to win the Valley Championship. Time for one or two more, and then we can do the tour. Do you have any? I have one last question. With the new NIL ruling coming down, allowing athletes to profit off their likeness, I know it's brand new, but have you yet developed a philosophy on how you're going to approach it? Um, University-wise, um, you know, department-wise, I should say, um, we've spent. Um, you know, I know uh, David Herbster and um, our administrative staff. Uh, we have uh, spent quite a bit of time uh, going through that and the things that we have to do from a university standpoint to be able to track uh, the opportunities that our players uh, may uh, receive. Um, you know, I, it, it, uh, um, it's, it's another one of those things that, you know, the NCAA kind of just threw in our lap <laughs> uh, without much guidance, and um, um, you know some of our players will will have and already have some of those opportunities on the table. And from a university standpoint, what our role will be is to support them in the way that we can support them, which is to make sure that any of the the deals that they uh, do have meet the standard of what is allowable as far as NIL legislation and uh, that we're tracking them in accordance with NCAA rule. Um, but I have a feeling that that will continue to grow. You know, right now I think people are just trying to figure out 
uh, exactly. And when I say people, I'm talking about outside people that may be interested in, in using student athletes to support their brand, trying to figure out how they're going to do that and how uh, to get student athletes involved. And so, you know, we just have to be ready to continue to adapt and continue to, to help and support our student athletes as those opportunities become available. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thanks, everybody.